Okay, it, it's a pleasure to have uh, Volkan Ishtar uh, as our uh, next, uh, as, our, as today's speaker for Romar Talks. I would like to thank him for that. And uh, Volkan is a pro uh, professor in, uh, at the University of Minnesota, and he's also uh, uh, has a second hat, and he's the uh, Samsung AI Center's uh, director, and so he's trying to carry two things at once. And as far as I can guess from his title, he will be uh, basically overviewing his research in uh, towards deploying autonomous robots in different basically uh, settings and, and dis discuss basically what his results are. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to have him and leave the stage for him. Thanks, Volkan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erol uh, It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for, for inviting me. Um, I, I'd like to also thank everybody for joining the talk. And um, I want to say, uh, Erol for those of uh, us robotics researchers in you know abroad, uh, Erol is like a, a Dennis Feneri for us. Uh, we, we see the, the, the great things he accomplishes uh, from our memleket, and it always uh, not only makes us proud, but also gives us feelings of nostalgia and you know home homesickness. Um, and I think Romar is is already uh, amazing, and I look forward to seeing what you will accomplish as, as part of it. And if I can contribute in any way, I I'd love to. Um, so so as Erolja mentioned, um, my my talk is a little bit non-standard. It's more kind of a sampling of the things that we've been doing over the years. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota. Um, I, I took a leave from my position about three years ago um, and joined the Samsung AI Center in New York, which I'll talk about a little bit. Uh, but this is a new uh, research initiative for Samsung, which is focused more on like fundamental uh, AI uh, beyond the standard R&D to think about you know, future, um, future technologies. So I'm currently uh, splitting my time um, and in terms of background, uh, so I'm from Adana, <laughs> and uh, uh, my family is from more Ichanadolu, Konya, Sivas, and so on. But uh, and I, um, I attended Bozici, Bilisar Mandisli, and then did my PhD at Pan, uh, postdoc at Berkeley. Um, I was a faculty member at Rensselaer. Uh, I know there are a lot of people, for the faculty in Bilkan from uh, Rensselaer. I don't know if there are anyone that ought to. Uh, PhDs from RPI, maybe a few, um, but then I joined Minnesota in 2008, so I've been here um, since then. Um, so my lab, uh, my lab, we, we call it the Robotics Sensor Networks Lab, and as you know, it's hard these days to get everybody, everybody in the same same room. So I have a few uh, pictures here. This is uh, from last year's uh, Thanksgiving. Um, let me also highlight. So this is Burak. Um, Burak uh, Burak is a PhD student. Um, his undergrad is from E2's uh, computer science uh, program. Um, on the right here, you'll see Haluka Hoja, who is also in this call. Um, he was a postdoc with me for almost uh, three years, right, Haluka? And uh, yes, correct, three years, more than uh, three years, actually. And now he um, he he is at Medinet University. Uh, uh, he founded his own lab, the field robotics uh, labs, uh, and he's doing amazing work. Uh, so those of you who are interested in field robotics, I would encourage uh, you. Um, other highlight. So this is Salem. Salem just graduated and he joined uh, Samsung. So from my group, uh, my one of my first PhD students, owner was actually from O2. Uh, he's at Google now. Um, and then uh, Ur Tarain, who was a postdoc, he's now back in Turkey and E2. And Deniz Soyalar is also in uh, Izmir, uh, Izmir Technology University. So she she came back. Um, so we had a good uh, amount of uh, representation in, in my lab. Um, the two newest editions, this is Burak Jr. And this is Gökdu. Uh, they're from Bilkan. So they just started their PhD programs in my group. Um, one of the reasons I cropped this picture a little bit differently is so here in Minnesota, we also established a robotics institute about uh, two years ago officially, but it's been part of a bigger state initiative. So we have our own space and this is our drone lab. So we cut like the ceiling of one floor. So we have a drone facility. And here you can see Nikolai, Selim and Minghan in the drone lab uh, a, a little bit. 
Um, so about the robotics program here, uh, this is Minnesota Robotics Institute. So if you're interested, uh, please take a look. Um, and uh, I'll just inject a little bit of advertisement here. So Minnesota, um, a lot of people know it for its cold weather, which is true. Uh, but Minnesota is actually, you know, a nice place with very high quality of life. And we have a very strong robotics program. So if you believe in rankings, the CS rankings, if you choose the robotics option, put us at number six. So it's a uh, um, compared to our general ranking, the robotics program is pretty strong. So so this is my kind of advertisement. Apologies. Um, but let me tell you about my my lab. So we we call it the Robotics Answer Networks Lab because when I first started it in 2005, a lot of our focus was around using robots uh, to supplement like static sensor networks. So this is from 2007 time period. You have you see this robot and what it is doing is it's looking for uh, wireless nodes. Um, sorry for the sound, I should have muted it. But if I fast forward, you see on that cone there is a um, wireless node. So the robot is charged with finding it, computing the optimal trajectory, op optimal download location, um, thing, things like that. Um, but of course, this was a little bit of a toy toy setup, um, and I, I wanted to do you know more sort of real field applications. And environmental monitoring is a topic close close to my heart. So around the time in uh, 2009, when I came to Minnesota, I read this article. So CARP is a Sazan, uh, but there are different types of Sazan. So the, there's like one version that's in the lakes. Uh, there's another version in the rivers but it's considered invasive because it's so resilient. Um, and this article mentions that um, this Chicago Canal is a uh, um, aerial jump. It's where we were on that boat uh, at uh, Iro. So it's that same canal. So they found one carp in there and then they decided to to poison the whole, whole stretch because they were worried that if the carp gets into the big lakes, then it will destroy the fishing industry and so on. So it's like a major, major environmental issue. Um, so I... I figured out that there's a actually a strong um, biology uh, fisheries uh, group here led by Dr. Peter Sorensen. And what they do is actually interesting. So they catch the fish live and then they put these radio tags in them. So then they put them back in the water um, and then they can track them. So then they study their behavior, their aggregations and so on. And to, to track them, they use these loop antennas, which are directional. So the, the tag... Uh, is designed to beep very infrequently. It's just one hertz so that it preserves the battery. But then you can hear the signal and then as you rotate the antenna, you get like a rough bearing measurement. So this is how they track the, the carb. So I figured this would be like a great uh, great task for you know, automation. So we started looking into building these uh, networks of autonomous boats. Um, and I like starting with this picture so that you get a sense of scale. So it's about uh, um, six feet. Um, and this was the project that Holuk actually joined later on uh, at the beginning of his PhD. Um, other contributors, so this is Pratap. Uh, Pratap is a professor at University of Maryland now. And this is Josh, who was at the Jet Propulsion Labs for many years, but recently he switched to, to, to Amazon. Um, this is uh, Patrick, who worked a lot on energy optimization, um, solar harvesting. He's now uh, this, he's a startup. And this is Nargis, who worked on search. And Nargis is at Google now. Uh, and it's a funny anecdote because one day they lost the boat. So she had to search for the boat <laughs> to, to, to find it. That was a radio radio issue. Uh, but let me tell you like some of the problems that we worked on. Um, so the first task is coverage, where you put the boats on, on, on the water, but you may not hear the signal. So the question is, how do you like find the signal as quickly as possible? And if you assume that the fish are mostly stationary um, and they do exhibit this loitering behavior, then it boils down to coverage problems. So we designed these coverage experiments. Uh, and um, around that time, this was actually one of the largest uh, experiments uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this area. So the, it's like a one hour experiment and the robot does almost like five kilometers. Um, so now once you, once you find the, the fish, then you can actually um, localize because the signal range could be 100 meters, so you don't know where it is. But you can use the directionality of the antenna to get a bearing measurement. So here you see it's a sampling 10 degrees and then taking five, six measurements. And then once you find the max of these measurements, you get the direction that the fish is in. 
so then you can have two robots who communicate for example and then decide where they should go and take the measurement and localize the fish uh, more more precisely and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this problem uh, in in a bit um this is to show that we also operate in the winter and in minnesota lakes freeze in the winter so we had to have a ground uh, ground platform uh but this is also this shows some of the beauties of uh oper you know doing actual field robotics because doing um odometry calibration typing in cold weather it's it's not that easy so but the students who who survived the frostbites and the sweat and blood, they all became very successful in their career. So it was a worthy, very worthy effort. Um, so then this project actually evolved into a drone-based project later on. Um, and here um, you see three um, three robots collaborating, maintaining formation, um, and. In this experiment, Haluk is there, Selim is there, and Nikola Stefas, who was our main UAV guy for quite some time, is, is there too. So you see the robots, uh, they're going to get in triangle formation, and then they will do the coverage in that formation to obtain uh, good measurements. Um, and I'll, I'll define what good means. Um, so as we were kind of working on drones and environmental monitoring um it became kind of a natural um next application domain to look into agriculture so in our um early days we um started looking into precision agriculture in row crop application so row crop means uh, things like corn soy um cotton maybe where you you can deploy in large scale in rows um, in contrast to uh, things like apple orchards, they're co called like specialty farms. So when a, a big application, now it is commercial level, but at the time it was relatively new, is to you know fly over the field and collect multispectral information, look for diseases. So since 2008, we've been actually doing work in this domain. Um, and what I wanted to um, talk about a little bit is give you some examples of the optimization problems that we worked on the, uh, rather than just the systems. Um, so here's here's one example. So this is related to the active sensing problem. So let's say there's a target that's where the star is, but you don't know where it is. Um, you have a robot. It could be a camera. It could be the directional antenna. Um, so it has a sensor that measures bearing. Bearing means angle, so you know which direction it is. Um, and then you know you get this measurement. So you know that the star is somewhere along this line, but you don't know you don't know where it is. Um, so the underlying geometric object is a ray, but if you have uncertainty, if you know like plus or minus some degrees, then it becomes a cone. So you know that the target is somewhere in this cone, but you don't know where. Um, so what do you do? I mean, this is why we have two eyes, right? If you have two of them, then you can intersect those rays and get the um, true location. Or if you have uncertainty, you can look at the intersection area and use its diameter or uh, area as a measure of uncertainty. So now my question is, um, well, I guess before that, um, can anyone in the audience tell me what factors affect the intersection area of, of this estimate? So don't be shy because I'll call out names if, if you know what the answer. So is the question clear? So I'm saying, um, I want to minimize this intersection area and which parameters in the um, in the setting in the system affect this area? Uh, distance between uh, observation points. Um, could you say again, please? Uh, distance between observation points. Very good. So the closer, the if you get closer, what happens to the area? Yes. Uh, if If you... Uh, become closer, then uh, the area becomes large. Larger or smaller? So if I move closer, this one, let's say, you see my cursor, right? Yes, yes, I, I see. So if this one gets closer, what happens to this area? Uh, area becomes uh, s uh, s smaller. Okay, okay. So, so then the, this one factor, right? We want this, this, these distances to be small, but remember that we don't know where the star is. Um, is that it, or is there another geometric factor? Can you guys? Let's keep the distances fixed. 
So we, we established that the distance is, is a factor. So let's keep the distances fixed. Um, does it mean that the area is fixed? There are some replies in the chat. Can you see that? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I don't see the chat window. Yes. No, yeah. Difference of angle between sensors. Uh, distance between the eyes. Yeah. Distance is one, and angle is the other one. So, um, so because if you if you draw a circle centered at the star, right, and then if you put the eyes on the boundary of the circle, then as you move along the circle, distance remains the same, but the the area changes, right? So what's a good angle? Let's do like extreme cases. If the angle is zero, the distance is large, right? Okay. All right. So <laughs> it's uh yeah. So 90, 90 is the is the optimal angle. Um that, 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 that's right. So um I have a lot of Halloween candy left. Uh, I wish I could give you guys uh, some some candy, but uh, I'll, I'll I'll do it next time. All right. So so now we established the underlying geometry of the setting, but um, here's the the interesting question. So let's get, go back to where we are, where we were. So so the robot was sitting here. It took this measurement. Now let's say there's only one robot and it wants to go and take the second measurement. Where should it go? Remember that it doesn't know where the, the star is, otherwise it wouldn't need to localize it in the first place. So, so how would you solve this problem, right? Um, and this is, I mean, there are different approaches to this, but this is what we call as active sensing. It's an online problem. So optimizing the trajectory in the presence of this type of uncertainty is, is a problem that we spend a lot of time, uh, uh, time on. Um, so there's a generalization of like we talked about this area of intersection, but you can also generalize it to multiple sensors by viewing it as you get a bearing measurement. So this uh, phi is the uh, bearing measurement, and then you perturb it. Um, and then if you write the measurement equation, you can actually look at the the determinant of that perturbation uh, matrix, which is called the Fisher information matrix. So you take the um, the partial derivatives with respect to the um, with, with respect to the um, the variables that you're interested in. So then you get something like what we arrived at, right? So the distances, you want these to be small and then the angle, you want this to be large to maximize the information. So you want this to be like 90 degrees. This the difference between phi is this, this angle. Um, so then there's also a closed form uh, way to write, write this problem. But of course the issue is this angle and distances are written with respect to the known location which you don't have in in practice so that's something that we need to deal with so in the kind of previous iteration of this problem um we spent a lot of time on designing you know geometric algorithms analyzing their performance showing performance bounds uh, this is what haluk also worked on as a big part of his phd um more recently we revisited this problem in a more uh, kind of a deep learning based framework um which now we had to give up on those like closed form guarantees, but the problem becomes much more easily generalizable. So what we did is, uh, and this is Selim's work, um, we treated these measurements all as images. So you can think of it as a histogram and the brighter represents the probability, you know, the, the, the higher the probability. <laughs> um, is somebody saying something? Okay. Um, all right. So if yeah, please please don't hesitate to 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 interrupt and uh, ask ask questions. Um, I'll I'll close the chat window so I don't see the the chat windows. But so in a nutshell, our approach is to use images to represent the uncertainty, and then we have a um, reward function that we try to optimize, and then we train it in a relatively standard like reinforcement learning type of uh, uh, framework. And, and this allows us to generalize it to multiple target, different sensing modalities. And I'll just show some images anecdotally. So, so the moving thing is the robot. And then you see the sort of the uncertainty of the PDF getting sh shrinking and shrinking around the true target locations. And the robot is optimizing its trajectory as the data becomes uh, available. 
Um, that was for bearing. This is if your measurements are distance measurements. So then it's a similar formulation, but the uncertainty is a more circular shape. Um, so that's one of the problems that we worked on in this domain. Um, now on the more geometric side, uh, here's an interesting version of the, the traveling salesperson problem, which you might be familiar. So traveling salesperson is the problem of given a bunch of cities, what is the shortest tour to, to, to visit all of them. Um, so here's a seemingly unrelated problem. So think about this field and let's say you want to fly over it and take some measurements. And let's make the assumption that green is good. And you know, if it is brownish, there's something going on there. So you might want to go and take close up measurements. So if you have a camera, you have the field of view of the camera and then the resolution is based on the altitude. So given this, this area, you can actually represent this in a, a version of this traveling salesperson problem where instead of cities points, you're given cones. So the angle is, based on the field of view and the height is the desired resolution. And then the question is like, what is the shortest tour to visit all of these cones? So this is a kind of a purely geometric problem that you can study as an optimization problem. And we looked at various versions of it and came up with approximation algorithms because the problem is NP, NP hard. Um, yeah, so, so I'll just quickly go over a few different examples um, this is a version of the coverage path planning where you have an energy constraint. So you, you cannot cover the whole environment in one battery charge. So you need to go back to base station and re recharge. So now how do you compute these, these partial tours? Um, so, so, so as we've been working on these problems, the, the main focus was on sort of taking measurements. But more recently, we started thinking about actually manipulating the, the farm. So here are some examples in that domain. So this is one um, setting where we want to mow uh, cow pastures. So we want to go after the cows uh, graze and eat the good grass. We want to go and cut the weeds. So for this, we built this platform, which we call the cowbot. Um, so as you can see, the, the domain is very, uh, very rugged. Um, it's hilly. There are a lot of uh, obstacles. Um, you have to deal with slopes, but we collaborated with a local company, Toro. So this is their platform. They put the the steering is very similar to what you did in your lab, uh, Haluk. They because the machine didn't have steering, so similar. But then from there up, we we built the uh, um, the basic you know motion controller and then motion planning planning on on top of it so this is this is the general system that we came out with and i think there are some videos of it doing the the mowing and coverage that you can see um and here are some actual plots of doing you know coverage um and this this project we we have one more year but we're, we're about to about to wrap up um so then over the Last, I would say, maybe seven, eight years ago, we we started thinking about moving from these hand-designed geometric representations to um, slightly more realistic representations that incorporate um, the, the 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 limitations of sensors and the environment constraints. So, what I mean by this is for the for this problem. You can just formulate it as given these cones, what is the minimum trajectory that you, you you need to visit them, right? So the representation is the cones, but in many problems, this representation is not that clear uh, and obtaining it is less so. So for example, for this coverage path planning problem I mentioned, we need to have a energy map, right? So that you can optimize for the trajectory, but where will this energy map come from? So we started looking into um, questions like this. And one problem that we worked on is energy consumption mapping. So we want, uh, and the way we formulated this is um, we get aerial images and we assume that the images are correlated with energy consumption because, you know, grass versus dirt, et cetera. So there's some correlation, but you don't know the actual value. So then we also assume that we have some sparse ground energy measurement. So as the robot moves around, 
you um, you get these energy measurements. And now we looked at the problem of predicting the energy consumption, um, which we used a uh, kind of a neural network, and we trained with with these uh, the, the collected data. And it's a pretty standard now a uh, unit based uh, architecture. But um, here are some examples of kind of predicted energy consumption, how well it matches the true value, and then uh, examples of uh, trajectories that I'll show next. So based on those measurements here, you can actually choose going between this one versus this one and do energy savings. Here are some other examples. Um, all right, so, so then, you know, the next kind of stage in the progression of our work is uh, moving on to specialty farms. Um, I was especially interested in specialty farms because like a, a common theme in robotics is to go from you know, factories where we already have a lot of good robotic systems, but factories are mostly controlled environments um, to the real world, right? Which is completely like unstructured, unknown, there might be humans, et cetera. And I felt like specialty farms actually provide a great like intermediate for a research frontier to study some of these fundamental robotics problems. It is somewhat structured, but not completely. And it is somewhat known, but there are a lot of unknowns. Um, so that we started this project on surveying apple orchards so um, we built multiple platforms this is one of the first like drone platforms actually that has like built-in obstacle mapping obstacle avoidance but the same system you can put it on a ground vehicle or carry it on um on on people so the people you actually hear nicolas stefas he was a big contributor to the drone um this is rambo he's now a target and this is cheng and Cheng is it in uh, Meta Facebook uh, uh, reality labs right now. Um, so some of the questions that we said, one is obviously like we want to be able to count the apples and measure their size. This is one of the earlier results, but you can see even if it's green um, and the setting is distorted, we can do this. Um, these are peaches, I believe, peaches or nectarine. Um, so the motion here is more more complex. Um, and this is an offline process data. So you see that there will be regions where you don't see the apples, but it's because they're on the other side, but we still uh, detect them and count them and maintain. So why are these interesting problems? So here's one 3D reconstruction question. Um, so a, a tree row is mostly straight, right? So as you go along it, you can do a 3D reconstruction. Um, but if you really want to count the apples on those trees, you also have to go to the other side and then, uh, you know, do it. you can also do a reconstruction there. But the question is, how do you merge those two reconstructions? So this is what you see on the first image. You have two sets of reconstructions, but you don't know um, how to merge them. And if you try to do like classical loop closure, um, it's very difficult because the distances are large. It's uh, just a linear motion um, and there are not enough features. So what we did is we used this semantic bundle adjustment idea where we use the tree trunks as the features to do bundle adjustment, which is an optimization technique that you can use to merge um, these two, two measurements. Um, so the, the system detects the ground, the, the trunks, and then it uses them as features to do the bundle adjustment. Um, and now once we have that, now we can actually merge counts from both sides. So now we have like a full 3D map of the farm where we know where the apples are, um, how many, their size, and so on. Um, and as part of this research, we actually released the data set. Um, and I think this was a month ago, so it looks like since its release in 2019, the data set has been downloaded more than 30,000 times, so there's been a lot of interest in, in this. So I would encourage, if you're interested, uh, play with it and let us know. Um, and this effort actually led to a startup. So there is now a startup which is trying to commercialize this. Um, and they made quite a bit of like technical progress. So now we can give farmers the system. They go, the, the system maps um, the fruit, builds these heat maps showing how many apples there are. And then you can also see the sort of size distribution, which helps them to do their planning for sales, for picking and, and all that. So, so as we were doing this, we also started collaborating with a group in Norway. Um, this is Paul uh, Johan from the group, and they built this uh, ground robot platform, um, which is also now uh, 
a company so called Saga. Um, but we collaborated with them on kind of porting some of our sensing technology to these uh, strawberry fields. And this is what, what came out of that collaboration. So we detect the berries. And then the the gripper design is uh, Bill, Bill Sean, who is from the Norwegian Technology of Life Sciences. Um, we collaborated on all the integration, calibration, and then the perception side is mostly mostly ours, but this is what the system looks like. Um, so along these lines, a more recent result from, from my group is this notion of mid-season weeding. So weeding means like Otleri uh, Olmak. Um, and usually it's easier to do it early in the season because you can drive over. And later on, you don't need to do it because the plants are large. But during the season, you still need to um, go in and then find the weeds between the plants. And this is the kind of view that you get. So it's very difficult, uh, difficult setting. So what we did for this is we actually um, built a perception system um, that goes you know, over the canopy. You'll see that little robot in there. Um, and then it has three cameras. So we use the front and back camera mainly for navigation and slam and then the right camera for detection. And once we have the, the map, we, we can actually merge. Um, I'll just jump to the, so these are the three views that you get. Um, and these back and front are mostly for slam. But then once we have the full map registered, we can actually find where the corn are and that anything that's not a corn is, is a weed so then it can be plugged. Um, it is still an ongoing question of how we do it, the actual weeding, but one possibility is to use this like weed trimmers, but then you know you have to be very precise. Uh, we also looked into laser, but it seems to be tricky. But so that's sort of where this 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 project is at. Um, and it's it's still still ongoing. So in the last uh, part of my talk, uh, any questions so far? Anyone? I don't let me open the chat window. So Mustafa Bayrak, Mustafa, why don't you ask your question? Unmute and uh, should I read it for you? Or I have a question about the Cowboy project. In the first slide, there were several runs since battery doesn't last long. And I guess different colors represent different runs in this diagram. How does the motion planner decide to generate path for different runs? Different runs there doesn't seem similar, is it procedural? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So first I should say that those plots are actually more for the drone. Um, I should have made it clear, but this is what you're referring to, right? Uh, here. Yeah, so, so in this setting, if you had enough battery, you could just go back and forth and then cover the whole environment, but then you would run out of battery, right? So the algorithm that we came up with is, you can think of it as a variant of depth first search. It goes and does coverage until it is just about to run off, run out of battery, including the time to go back, and then goes back. So those are the, the paths that you see. So if green is the first one, it went here, did this coverage, but somewhere along here, it decided it needs to go back, and then it went back. And then you repeat this, and then we can bound the number of times it needs to do it. So that's, that's the algorithm. And this is the work of Ming Han Mei. So he has actually multiple papers on this. So you can look at those papers and or more about it. Is it clear? Cool. Any other questions? Great, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Go for it. Uh, hello, my name is Simi. Uh, I'm a PhD student in electrical and electronics engineering. Uh, I wonder that uh, how uh, did your research group uh, get a permission to work on farms? I mean, uh, mm. do you have any farm owners on research group or uh, did you just uh, went and go uh, talk with the owners of the farm? I wonder that. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So in, 
in the US, there are these uh, universities called land grant universities. So land grant means land and sea grant. At some point, the government gave land to establish these universities. And these are mostly the big state universities that you may have heard of, like, you know, Michigan, Minnesota, and so on. And their initial charge was actually to support the local industry, which back in the day was mostly, you know, agriculture and mining. So then you'll see that they have, they had agricultural machinery departments, which evolved into mechanical engineering down the line. Um, and then they had, you know, depending on the area, if it's Texas, like petroleum, so they have chemical. So in Minnesota, mining is also big. Um, and that led to, you may have heard of the company 3M. So that's a Minnesota company, for example. So agriculture is a big part of the university's mission. And we have a whole campus dedicated to, to agriculture. Um, I mean, in Adana, Chukurova also is a big, like, agriculture uh, domain. So yeah, also. Yeah. So sorry, what did you say? In Konya also there are lots of farms. That's, that's true, yeah, and Konya. So it's actually kind of a, uh, so the where I am right now, Midwest is kind of like uh, each other, dollar. so Konya. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it kind of has that feel where, you know, you go over the Toroslar and then once you get to Ereli and so on, you start seeing, seeing those fields. So it's very much like that, very flat, uh, a lot of fields. Um, so, um, but I also wanted to do, so my PhD is very much on kind of theoretical problems, but I always wanted to have a applied side to it. And then my mountain monitoring is a great application domain, but it wasn't like a real industry. So part of this, um, part of my research agenda was to work in an industry where there's like real, you know, industry. And that has its pros and cons. Then you don't have to justify the problems that you work on. You know, it's like, they tell you what those problems are but then again it sometimes it becomes too applied because like agriculture is a very money um money tight industry r d is it usually goes into you know the bio side of things and so on um so most of my funding still comes from fundamental robotics program like the equivalent of to which is called nsf here mm -hmm. um yeah thank, thank you very much and this is my only like conclusion slide. And what I want to say is, you know, AI is, there are many facets to it, but I think in robotics, if we need to, if we want to make progress toward having real systems that operate in the sort of real environments, I think we have to look at at least these three dimensions. We need to build systems, but also systematically learn, you know, representations um, to operate in in these in these environments so we cannot just live with hand design representations and then the third dimension is you know there are many optimization problems that i think we still need to solve to make this system um these systems uh, operate so i'm excited that i have the opportunity to work on like these three dimensions uh, in parallel and i i'm uh, hopeful that soon we'll see more and more capable systems in the future well, that's all. So thank you all. Thank you all very much. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. That's my email. Um, feel free to reach out. I'm very slow in responding to email these days, but I'll do my best. So <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks again.